The medieval knight is often romanticised as a gallant figure, mounted on a steaming charger, armoured in shining mail and ready to joust for honour, or to embark on quests for the love of a fair lady. However, the true life of a knight, from the raw recruit to the battle-hardened veteran, was steeped in rigorous training, governed by the Shimbaovic Code, and evolved significantly from the Norman conquest through the Middle Ages. This video explores the journey from squire to knight, the contradictions between chivalric ideals and practice, and the transformative role of knights over time. In October 1066, a group of Norman knights landed on the Sussex coast, marking the beginning of a pivotal chapter in history with their conquest of England. Distinguished by their close-cropped hair, a mark of holy orders in England at that time, these tough, hard-bitten warriors were initially mistaken for priests by the local people of Hastings. The Norman conquest of 1066 was not just a pivotal moment in English history, it marked the beginning of a transformation in military and social structures, with the Norman knights introducing feudalism and a new order of chivalry to England. The Normans were adept warriors known for their disciplined cavalry tactics, which played a crucial role in their victory at the Battle of Hastings. This victory and subsequent rule over England set the stage for the evolution of knighthood as a cornerstone of medieval society. The journey to knighthood began in childhood. At around seven years old, a boy destined to be a knight was sent away to a nobleman's house to serve as a page. Here he learned the basics of swordmanship, horse riding, courtly manners, hunting and hawking, and preliminary martial skills. At the age of 14, the page ascended to the role of squire. As a squire, he undertook more serious military training, learning about armour maintenance, ran errands, did chores and served directly under a knight, often accompanying him in battles. This phase was critical, blending rigorous physical demands with lessons in leadership and loyalty. Upon reaching his early twenties, a squire could be elevated to knighthood. The ceremony symbolised the squire's readiness to undertake the responsibilities and to live by the chivalric code. Chivalry is the name given to the idealised qualities of knighthood, which included honesty, courtesy, respect towards women and a readiness to defend the weak. Though loutish realities often belied these virtues, gallant standards were at least set and followed by some. The knighting ritual was steeped in religious sanctity and symbolic acts. It not only conferred martial honour, but also integrated the knight into a societal role imbued with responsibility to protect and uphold the virtues of the realm. On the evening before, he had been ritually cleansed in a bath of rose water, followed by a solitary vigil of prayer within the church until dawn. In the morning, he attended a mass amid the smoke of incense and the glow of candles. No doubt with heart pumping, he would walk slowly before a large congregation of well-wishers towards the altar, where the priest stood waiting, holding the blade he was to bless. Bless this sword, that thy servant may henceforth defend churches, widows, orphans, and all those who serve God, against the cruelty of heretics and infidels. Bless this sword, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, Eternal God. When the blessing was over, his Lord would step forward and deliver a light blow to the cheek. This tradition, known as the Koli, serves as a reminder that the knight should endure hardships without complaint. Following this, the Lord wraps a sword around the young man's waist, signifying his readiness to defend his Lord, the weak, and uphold justice. The sword is a knight's primary weapon, and this act symbolises the transfer of martial responsibility to him. Next, spurs are fastened to the soon-to-be knight's heels, another key symbol in the knighting ceremony. Spurs represent the knight's status as a mounted warrior, ready to ride into battle at his lord's command. Finally, the newly dubbed knight draws his sword and brandishes it three times. This act is both a declaration of his readiness to undertake his new duties and a recognition of the honour bestowed upon him. By returning the sword to its scabbard, he signifies his understanding that the power of the sword should be wielded with wisdom and restraint. 
He is now officially a knight, marked by ritual, responsibility, and the blessing of both his lord and the divine. The life of a knight was not all battles and tournaments. When not engaged in warfare, knights managed their lands, dispensed justice, and participated in the social life of the nobility. They trained continuously, maintaining their equipment, and were expected to act as models of chivalry within their communities. When the first tournaments began, it was a violent and bloody contest among young members of the military caste, who formed teams and engaged in mock battles. At one such event in France in 1180, more than 3,000 mounted knights took part, and the field was left littered with dead and wounded at sundown. Members of the clergy attempted to divert young knights into gentler pastimes, such as hunting with hawks and hounds. But, at that time, the games were regarded as necessary rehearsal for warfare. A knight cannot shine in war if he is not prepared for it in tournaments, wrote one chronicler. He must have seen his own blood flow, have had his teeth crackle under the blow of an adversary. In time, these events evolved into more stylized and less lethal contests. Tournaments provided a venue for knights to hone their skills, gain fame, and sometimes fortune. Jousting involved heavily armoured knights with blunted lances meeting one another at a headlong gallop in front of crowds who watched from stands decked with pennants. And, true to the traditions of courtly love, ladies bestowed their favours on knights with personal tokens, such as the handkerchief or ring. Warfare, on the other hand, served as the crucible, in which a knight's valour and loyalty were proven, often at great risk to life and limb. Amidst the chaos of battle, knights clad in heavy armour charged into the fray, facing not only the immediate threat of enemy weapons, but also the gruelling physical demands of combat the clashing of swords, the thundering hooves of horses, and the cries of the wounded filled the air, creating a tumultuous environment where bravery, strategy, physical strength, and sheer willpower were indispensable. In these harsh conditions, a knight's commitment to his lord and to the ideals of chivalry was put to the ultimate test, with every charge and parry carrying the potential for glory or grievous injury. During the 12th and 13th centuries, the romanticised knightly codes of chivalry were more the exception than the rule in warfare. Battles were typically small, dirty skirmishes rather than the grand occasions of legend. Fully armoured knights adorned with heraldic symbols on their shields and surcoats often charged at inexperienced infantry, instilling fear with their formidable appearance. Civilians, lacking the protection of city walls or strongholds, were vulnerable to raids that left them beaten or robbed. Sieges were the most common form of combat, with little compassion for the vanquished. A striking example of the brutality of the time was Edward the Black Prince's siege of Limoges, where he is alleged by a French chronicler to have ordered the slaughter of 3,000 inhabitants, including women and children a flagrant violation of the chivalric norm, although some accounts suggest the death toll was closer to 400. Knights led armoured units, supported by squires, pages, and sometimes an archer. A charge by a formation of knights was usually conclusive. However, knights had significant vulnerabilities. Their armour was not impervious to attacks by projectile weapons, longbows and crossbows, and once dismounted, the heaviness of their armour made it difficult for them to rise swiftly, leaving them exposed to battery or stabbings. From the glamour of the tournament and horrors of warfare, knights and nobles returned to lives in isolation within their castles and fortified manors. Families attended chapel every morning, and for pastimes there was chess, backgammon and dice, lavish feasts, music and the elaborate etiquette of court life. Although the Great Hall was still the central feature of all manors and castles, more specialised rooms were coming into being. By screening off one end, for example, the Lord made a small private room called a sola for himself and his lady. And as buildings became more elaborate, the lady herself, secluded in her chamber, became a focus for the illicit passions associated with courtly love. 
This period also saw the rise of the troubadours, who spread the ideals of courtly love, adding a layer of romantic intrigue to the social fabric. It glorified the love of a knight for his chosen lady, who might be anybody but his own wife. Sir Lancelot's love for King Arthur's Guinevere was in this tradition. The introduction of new military technologies and tactics such as the longbow and pike formations began to diminish the battlefield dominance of the knight. The cost of maintaining armoured cavalry also became prohibitive for many, leading to a decline in the traditional role of knights as the elite fighting force. By the late Middle Ages, the social and military landscape had shifted significantly. The rise of professional armies and changes in warfare marked the end of knighthood's golden age. However, the social status and titles associated with knighthood persisted, transforming into a more ceremonial role within the nobility. While traditional knighthood has long vanished, the image of the knight as a courageous armoured guardian adhering to the code of honour endures and continues to inspire. True, when we look into it further, we find the lived experience of knights often diverged from the idealised portrayal, but at least the ideal existed and some attempted to live by it. Some of our most popular books, art and movies extol the virtues of chivalry, painting a picture of nobility that transcends time. In Star Wars, the Jedi Knights are the quintessential representation of medieval chivalry transposed into a space opera setting. Star Trek explores the chivalric ideas through its portrayal of Starfleet officers, particularly in characters like Captain James T. Kirk and Captain Jean-Luc Picard. Starfleet's prime directive to observe but not interfere with the development of alien cultures echoes the chivalric principle of respect for sovereignty and the dignity of others. The spirit of knightly chivalry surely includes the Lord of the Rings, where members of the Fellowship, especially Aragorn, embody the ideals of bravery, sacrifice and loyalty in their quest to destroy the One Ring. The Dark Knight trilogy reimagines Batman as a modern-day knight fighting injustice in Gotham with a code of ethics that forbids killing, showcasing his struggle between upholding his noble ideals and confronting the darkness within himself and his city. These modern interpretations of the Shilvauric Code highlight the enduring appeal of knightly virtues in storytelling, adapting ancient ideals to contemporary contexts and challenges. They underscore a universal longing for heroes who exemplify the best of human values, proving that the spirit of chivalry continues to inspire and resonate with audiences across the ages. Music